If you were here for the very first time last Sunday, let me start with an apology that you uh, do not get to listen to Thomas preach again today. <laughs> if you were here last week, you know the gift uh, that Thomas has. I think the gift that I wanna, wanna pronounce uh, and pray as blessing over Thomas, our youth pastor, is <clears throat> there are people who are good preachers because they're just good orators. And there's a lot of those. You've probably found them before. You might even choose them online because they speak so eloquently. Um, here, one of the things that I appreciate most about my friend Thomas, and the real gift that he truly is to our church, is not that he is eloquent, though he is that. But what you find is, back in John 2, I think I was saying this, that the more you get into the word, the more the word, Jesus, gets into you. And one of the gifts that Thomas is bringing our students every week, and the gift he brings us on occasion in the sermon is, he spends so much time with Jesus. He is so in love with the person of Jesus, with the written words of him, about him, from him, that when he gets up here and sits on this stool, eloquent or not, the word of God will be proclaimed. It's going to be spoken whether you hear it or not because what goes in a person is what then comes out of the person. And in Thomas, we have one in whom the spirit is strong. The spirit is deep. And uh, you'll get to hear from him again. So if this is your second week, welcome back. I'm Brent, and I'm the pastor of this campus of our church. And uh, I'm honored to get to be up here each week because uh, the thing I try to do is exactly what he did and what other preachers do from this stool, and that is to take what we've been investing our time in this week, what we were listening for from Jesus this week, and then articulate the parts of it that maybe Jesus intended not only for the preacher, but also for the hearer. And that's always our prayer on Sunday mornings, is that whatever we proclaim from the Lord is a word that the Lord has for you, because it's already been a blessing uh, to us, to me. One of the things that Thomas talked about, we were uh, in John chapter five last week, and if you're new to our church or new to, to worship in this, on this campus, I want you to know that we are currently on a very long journey through the gospel of John. We started with John one, and we go week at a time, one chapter at a time. There's a, a little book, I think we may already be out of these, but we had 700 of them, and now they're gone. But there is a PDF version. If you go to our church website, you can pull this up on our homepage, and you'll see the guide. It's all in a PDF. You can go week by week. If you're on Instagram, you'll find a, a post every week that shows you the daily readings that you should be reading in preparation for the sermon as well. But last week in John 5, one of the things that just grabbed me, and I was worshiping online from Fort Worth, one of the things that just grabbed me was this statement he made, that there was the pool of Bethesda, and then there was the temple. And the place where the people who were in most need were going for their needs to be met was not the temple, but was rather this pool. Man, that was convicting. He talked a lot about young people, but I'm an old person, and i an older person, and I was thinking about, am I pastoring a church? If we collected a group of people that have committed the sin of sending people somewhere else for the healing and for their needs to be met, when we who are followers of Jesus have found at one time or another that this is the place, he is the one who meets every need, have we modeled for this watching world that maybe the church and maybe Jesus isn't enough and so we'll come and get some Jesus, and he'll be part of who we are and what we receive. But we know the world has a lot more for us as well that maybe Jesus doesn't quite complete. I mean, that's a difficult thing to deal with, and I've been dealing with it all week, thinking about this. Have I allowed, personally, have I allowed other things in my own life? Have I, do I need them so much because Jesus is not enough? And we're gonna kind of stick with that theme today. But I wanna to try to circle it in a way that, that tries to remind you and encourage you with a second laugh that Jesus truly is all you need. He is all you need. And I suspect that if I need to be reminded of it over and over to be convinced of it, that maybe you need to hear it over and over to be convinced of it as well. And so we are moving into John chapter six. For those of you who are reading along with us, you know that. So let me just read the first several verses to get us started here in John 6. So sometime after this, Jesus crossed 
to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Maybe they were there at the pool. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and he sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. And when Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? And then John, the author here says, he asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. I think that's an interesting verse to kind of throw in there. Philip answered Jesus, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one even to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, he spoke up and he says, here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place and they sat down, about 5,000 men were there, which leads us to believe there were probably a number of women and children as well. Then he took the loaves and he gave things and he distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. And he did the same thing with the fish. So Jesus on the mountain sees this big crowd coming, 5,000 plus women and children. And this little boy has a small lunch sack of barley, bread, and fish. And he says, well, well, do we have enough to feed everyone? Everyone's calling that into question. And Jesus says, no, just have them sit down. It'll be good. And he took bread from that boy. Now, granted, they were barley loaves, not these bigger Italian versions. But he took the bread. And this really interesting, beautiful, miraculous thing started to happen. The bread began to multiply itself in the hands of Jesus. No matter how much bread Jesus took and broke and handed out, it just kept going. It just kept growing. He, he passed it out. Just like I'm gonna pass it out to you. I think Pam might even have some people who are gonna help me pass it out. I want you just to take a piece and don't eat it. Take a piece and then hand the loaf to the next person. Just take a piece and hand a loaf to the next person until everybody has it. Until everybody has it. Here, take a piece, Phil. Roberta, remember, don't eat it. Don't eat it, just hold it. There you are. And they'll be passing it around. This is exactly what's happening on that mountainside. Jesus has this bread and he just keeps breaking it. And he hands it to the disciples, the apostles, and they just start going amongst the crowd. Can you imagine if you were at the back of the crowd? I wonder if there'll be enough for me. Surely not, it'll feed about a dozen folks up front. I mean, this was the bread that was sent with this boy for lunch. Have y'all not gotten any? Here, I'll let you. Are y'all getting some over there? Keep passing it around. If you don't have some, put your hand in the air. We wanna make sure everybody gets a piece. Because just like this story in the scriptures, the bread just kept going and going and going. The Bible says, the Bible here says, that the bread just kept multiplying and everyone ate their fill. They just kept eating. If they ate their first piece, you want more? I want more. The Bible says they ate this bread until they were satisfied. Now, I don't know if that means until they were full, like they just kept eating it like they had never read the book Wheat Belly and they just kept eating and eating and eating. Or if they took their one piece and held it, and as they watched the bread multiplying, they go, oh, this will not be food. This shall be souvenir. This shall be moment that sits in an enclosed case on my fireplace mantle because this will remind me always of the day on the mountain when I and 5,000 other dudes and 
and their wives and their children were fed from that little boy's lunch. The Bible says that he just kept breaking it and giving it, breaking it and giving it. Everyone had their fill. Everyone was satisfied. And then the Bible says that there was so much left over that the the 12 went around with baskets saying, do you have anything left? And they had had so much that they weren't even hiding what they had left. They just put it in the basket and there were 12 baskets of leftovers. Now the Bible doesn't tell us what happened to the fish, whether they picked up the fish or not. Maybe they just said, well, everybody's had enough, perfect, let's just throw what you have left in the lake. But the bread, there was enough. There was more than enough. Everybody got some. Now, after this this feeding of 5,000 people, just keep holding the bread. During this feeding of 5,000 people, It ends, the baskets have passed, the bread has been collected, you get to keep yours. And then he goes off to a mountain because the Bible says people saw what was happening, they thought that he was gonna be taken by force and put in charge, and he wasn't about that. So he gets away, goes to a mountain. The chapter six continues that while he's on the mountain, the disciples get into their boat and they get in and they paddle three or four miles off the shore Jesus comes down out of the mountain. Hey, boat's gone. Oh, there they are. And he just walks on the water. I don't know if you caught the detail, but it says right before he walks on the water that they had paddled out three or four miles. I mean, there's something about running across the water for five or 10 feet, but three or four miles, he's out here on the water and he's just walking. He gets to the boat, boat comes to shore, and then comes another teaching. starting in verse 25. When they found him on the other side of the lake, this is the crowd, the ones who had been fed, the ones who have a fresh memory of watching a little boy's lunch turn into enough for thousands. They meet him, and they ask him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, you're looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and you had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, for on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, what must we do to do the works God requires? To which Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, What sign then will you give that they may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our answer, it's like, I wanna stop there. What will you do? What else do I need to do? I just fed, weren't you there? I just fed 5,000 plus people. What are you gonna do to show us? (laughs) Okay, here we go again. What will you do? They say, our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it's not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, it's my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Like, give us, give us that bread. I just did. No, 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 give us this other bread. Maybe they picked up, the, in the Greek, there's a couple ways of saying bread of life. There's one that's like bio, which as you know, biology is like human, physical structure. I eat it, I digest it, it keeps me alive. And then there's the zoe, which is like the ministry we're supporting with our children's offering, Z-O-E, which is like eternal life, like deep residential life of God in a person. What are they looking for? What are they asking for? Well, when I'm reading this, maybe you found yourself here too, that just a couple chapters ago, we have Jesus meeting a woman at the well, and as they get to know each other over the well, water being passed between them, Jesus says this very interesting thing to the woman, right? He says, if you knew who I was, I would give you something to drink. 
that would well up into eternal life, right? This was just a couple chapters ago where he's talking about this water. She says, give it to me so that I will not thirst again and will not ever have to come back to this well for water again. She has this encounter with the living water. And here we are two chapters later, Jesus proclaiming to be living food, bread, bread of life. It also, for the first century hearers, takes them back to a story that they're much more familiar with than we are because they lived it, at least more closely than we have lived it. It was just a a handful of generations before they remembered this Exodus story that was in their Bible of a time when the Israelites, their forefathers and foremothers, had been freed from slavery, had gone out into the wilderness, got out to the wilderness and started grumbling Now, mind you, this is after they've already gotten to the the Red Sea. It's been parted for them to walk through. It has closed down over their enemies. They've now seen fresh water given to them, and they still have the audacity to complain. The audacity to say, did you bring us out here all this way so that we could starve to death? And they start recounting and recalling, well, at least back in slavery, we had like pots of stew we'd sit around. It was awesome. And here we are with nothing. So when Jesus says that God was the one who gave them that bread, it wasn't Moses. In some ways, he's kind of stepping in as the new Moses, theologians would say. And he's saying, I am giving you the bread from God now. And it's not this manna, which in the, in the Hebrew uh, literally means, what is this? <laughs> but I'm giving you bread. I'm giving you the bread of life. This recollection of Exodus 16, but then as this story continues, and you, many of you read it, I hope, in verse 48, Jesus is talking to them about this bread of life. He says, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live. This bread is my flesh, which I will give you for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Now, this is is where things start getting a little bit weird. A little bit weird. Now Jesus is saying, eat my flesh. Now in our modern day reading, and and it it appears that these, these guys, these Jews as well, They hear that Jesus is manna, Jesus is the bread of life. Now Jesus says, eat my flesh. And the first place they go, cannibalism. Do we really think that's what Jesus is trying to get at here? I don't think so. Maybe you do. And there's why, that's why even the disciples who were hearing all of this, they get a little confused, they get a little affronted, they get a little bit sort of uh, frustrated. In fact, they get so frustrated that some of them Some of them say, I I don't know. I don't know if I can take this teaching. He just keeps going on and on about being the bread of life, the bread of heaven, the one that the Father has sent. And so then picking up in verse 66. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and they they no longer followed him. But Jesus said, you do not want to leave too, do you? Saying to the twelve. You do not want to leave too. Now, in our, in our modern day reading, we are, it's hard to forget what we already know, right? And so we, who gather every week for communion, once a week, or once a month, rather, for communion, it's hard for us to think about what Jesus is saying without also thinking of communion, the Eucharist. But these listeners were not even there yet. Sacramental theology was not a thing. They weren't thinking about communion. They had not yet had the Passover meal with Jesus where he declares that this is my body given for you. They're just hearing this guy say, my flesh is the bread of life. So what do you do with it? I mean, mean, what do you do with this idea that Jesus is offering us of, unless you eat my flesh, you have no life in you? What do you do with that? As I was reading this week, one of the things that really got me, I was sitting on my back patio reading this. And then this really interesting statement comes into my ears. It was as if Jesus was saying to me, he said, wait a second, let me get this right. 
So I feed 5,000 people from five barley loaves, two fish. You don't even question that. I walk three to four miles across this lake, and you're good with that. But I say that unless I am in you, you will die, and now you got a problem? I tell you, unless you take me into yourself, unless you want me more than you want anything else, until you depend on me and rely on me like you've never depended or relied on anyone or anything else, that offends you? That's hard to hear? It's hard to consider? Jesus confronted me with that this week. And all I can get around is that some of these miracles have become so familiar to us that we just go, oh yeah, he fed the 5,000 again. I heard that when I was a kid. I've heard that story over and over since. Oh yeah, he walked on water. I mean, he, he healed this man without him having to get into the pool of Bethesda. This is just what Jesus does. But now Jesus says, I am all you need. And if anything takes the place of me, you will die. I am life, and I'm the only life that you get. It feels like he's asking me over and over and over, am I your everything, Brent? When he's asked these weird questions before, he said it to Nicodemus, unless you're born again, you can't have eternal life. Nicodemus says, well, get back in the womb. I mean, this isn't, this isn't the first time we're hearing Jesus use some really scandalous sort of illustrations to get to a point. The first sermon that I ever preached, it was my tryout sermon. You can go back and listen and see if they should have hired me or not. But that entire sermon, I held a loaf of bread. My task was to preach the one line from the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread. And in that sermon, I remember telling a story. It was a story that I had read in a small book that was entitled Sleeping with Bread. Maybe you've read the book, maybe you've heard me share this story before. But there's a book called Sleeping with Bread, Holding What Gives You Life. And at the beginning of that book, there's a story of back in the World War II when bombs were dropping on communities. If a child was to wake up in their home alive with no parents, they would go out into the street wandering, looking for what's going on in this place. They'd go to bed at night, it was dark, bombs would drop, they'd wake up in the morning and see what was left. And there were these orphanages that sort of started to sprout up, these aid agencies that would, they would start to gather these children. Hey, but where do you live, little boy? Where, do you, where, where are your parents, little girl? And they'd find that these children didn't have parents left. They couldn't find their parents. And so they'd start gathering them. And they'd have them in these homes. And what they found was these children were having such a difficult time going to sleep. They'd wake up all night, throughout the night. They could never go to sleep and stay asleep. And someone had this interesting idea Let's give each kid a piece of bread. Let's give them a piece of bread as they go to to sleep each night. We can at least say in the doing of that, you will eat tonight, and tomorrow morning you will eat again. It was this way of giving hope to a person who who had begun to trust everything around them that, look, there's this I can give you. That bread that's in your hand, I just want you to put it in your hand where you can see it. I believe this teaching, what Jesus is trying to get at in this, this is me. This bread in your hand, it's me. I am the bread of life. You have me now. You'll have me forever. It's like Jesus is saying, when you think about your relationship with me, I want you to stop thinking about what I can do for you, what I can give you, and instead think about, I am with you. Because as Jesus says, you eat that bread, it's gone, consumed, you'll still die. It is the last thing you ever eat. You will die, malnourishment. You take Jesus into you, the bread of life into you, Jesus says, you'll never die. This Jesus, he wants to be your all. He doesn't want to be one thing on your plate that you get to if you have enough in you to eat more. 
He doesn't want you to even eat him first and then eat all that the world has to offer to get your fill. He wants you to take him. He's enough. He wants to be the thing you wake up to every morning. He wants to be the last one you're with every evening. He wants to be your all. And the reason I can preach this message to you is because sometimes he's not my all. And sometimes he's not your all. And sometimes we've allowed ourselves to be convinced that there's something out there that if I just had that, then I would be satisfied. And Jesus is saying, until you have me in you, you'll never be satisfied. So there was a hymn that I used to sing as a child, and maybe, maybe you've sung this hymn before as well. If you grew up in the church, you probably have sung it. I just wanna sing the chorus. And if you know it, I wanna invite you to sing it along with me. I need thee, oh, I need thee, every hour I need thee, oh, bless me now, my Savior, I come to thee. Let's do it again. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee, oh, bless me now, my Savior, I come to thee. You're still not convinced. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee, oh, bless me now, my Savior, I come to thee. Those who knew him best. In verse 68 and 69, Simon Peter, when he says, do you want to leave me too? Are you not yet convinced that I'm all you need? And Simon Peter says, no. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, let it be so for you and for me. Amen.